Good, and welcome. So it's been, this is our first lecture in the stable since, gosh, August of 20, 2019, I think. So, uh, welcome. I hope for the next time we meet in this auditorium, uh, we, won't, we can dispense with the masks, but uh, that's still to be determined. Um, I want to first thank our sponsors of today's lecture, Mary Copeland and Kate Wharton. Thank you very much. And, uh, and now it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Um, many of you may know that June 19th is Beatrix Farron's birthday. Today we're celebrating her 150 years. And uh, we're celebrating it with Judith Tanker, the author of Beatrix Farran, artist, art, garden artist, landscape architect, which was published by Monticelli Press this past March. Um, Judith is a landscape historian, preservation cons consultant, and the author or co-author of 10 books on historic gardens and garden design. She taught at the Landscape Institute at Harvard University for more than 20 years, and has served as a board member of the Beatrix Farran Society. So please join me in welcoming her. Yes, June 19th was Juneteenth, <laughs> Juneteenth, and it was also Father's Day. But more importantly for our audience today, it was the 150th anniversary of Beatrix Barron's birth, which for most of us is a cause of celebration. Well, as many of you know, Beatrix Barron was one of America's most celebrated landscape architects, and she was renowned for the estate gardens that she designed for the Cream of East Coast Society that stretched from Maine to Washington, D.C., but she's also celebrated for her work as a consultant for prestigious new universities and public landscapes. Well, I became, first became interested in her many years ago through her friendships with the great English gardeners, William Robinson and Gertrude Jekyll. Beatrix Barron, in fact, is sometimes called the Gertrude Jekyll of America, but she was, in fact, so much more She owed her success to her extraordinary knowledge of horticulture, her unerring eye for design, her phenomenal energy, and her deep commitment to her profession that inspired many others to follow in her footsteps. And during her long 50-year career, she received more than 200 commissions from some of the foremost financiers, the arts patrons, and educators of the day. And these were mostly what we would call today old guard families from New York, Philadelphia, and Boston who were part of her social circle. And these included the Morgans, the Rockefellers, and the Harknesses, among many, many others. She enjoyed long working relationships with many of her clients, especially Mildred Bliss, Dorothy Payne Whitney, Abby Aldridge Rockefeller, among others. And this is a portrait of her taken in the 1920s in her New York City office at the peak of her career, surrounded by her beloved books and also her beloved dog, Cubby. Well, she was born in 1872, June 19th, and embarked on her career in the 1890s when she was in her early 20s. And this was the time, that you will recall, when upper-class society women typically did not take up a profession. She enjoyed a privileged childhood, living on East 11th Street in near Washington Square in New York City. Her father, Frederick Rhinelander Jones, came from an old New York family, and her mother, Mary Catwallader Jones, came from an equally prominent Philadelphia family. Unfortunately, their marriage was not a success, and her parents lived separately for many years before they finally divorced in 1896. And this is a, a painting of Beatrix Jones, as she was then known, uh, when she was a debutante, and it's part of the collection of the Dumbarton Oaks in Washington, D.C. Well, Beatrix's dynamic mother presided over a literary salon that included Henry James, Teddy Roosevelt, John LaFarge, Henry Adams, 
Augustus Danko, and among many, many others. Minnie, as yeah, she was known among her close friends, was a very active woman. She wrote for Scribner's Magazine. She did charitable work for hospitals in New York City. And she later, of course, was assistant to her very famous sister-in-law, Edith Wharton. So as a result, Beatrix Jones was very well versed in literature and the arts. So it's not surprising that early on she rejected the idea of life as a society matron. And this was just in my estimate, perhaps based on her parents' and their unhappy marriage. She decided on a career as a landscape gardener in the hope of generating some income. But since there were no formal courses in landscape arts at the time, uh, she studied horticulture privately with Charles Sprague, sergeant of the Honorable Labyrinthum, the first director of the Honorable Labyrinthum. And he also was a family friend of Mary Cadwallader Jones. And after a rigorous two-year study, she then followed his advice to study garden design, both here and abroad. And it's also important to remember she didn't study garden design with, with Sargent. She did simply study horticulture with him. So, in 1895, Beatrix and her mother embarked on a four-month journey visiting gardens all over Europe, such as just picking one here, Jardin d'Este in Algiers, which had been created in the 19th century by the French government as a testing ground for plants. The Indian fig trees that we can see in this contemporary photograph by Country Life magazine, even in the 19th century, were huge at the time of Beatrix Jones's visit. During this, this four-month trip, she also studied the finer points of garden design, and she kept famously a garden notebook of her observations about many of the places she visited, including the famous Italian villas, such as the Villa, Villa Gambaria at the top, obviously, and the uh, Isola Bella. Her visit to the Gambaria in 1895, for those of you who are knowledgeable about Italian villas, predated, of course, the famous water garden that we all know today. But in her, in her notebook, she criticized maintenance issues and design errors and elsewhere. So right from the start, she had a good critical eye for design. It's also Interesting to note that she, for this particular trip with Minnie, she came armed with a copy of Charles Platt's recent book on Italian gardens. But one is also left wondering how much influence Edith Wharton had on this trip. She was also captivated by the grand formal gardens of André Le Notre in France, such as the sweeping parterres at Versailles and Bolivica. And years later, she would write about André Lenotre in Scribner's Magazine. The European formal garden tradition, of course, was all the rage in American estate gardens at the time. So in England, she visited Gertrude Jekyll's famous garden at Munstead Wood. But whether she actually met the woman is unknown. It's never been said. In 1895, for all of those of you who know your Gertrude Jekyll history, Gertrude Jekyll had not yet written any of her famous books. Her first book came out in 1899. So it may possibly have come about to an introduction to a child. Big Sergeant Gertrude Jekyll was writing, however, for many, many of the garden magazines. She was, of course, renowned for her distinctive style of planting and broad washes of color, such as these incredible aster borders that she had at her garden at Munstead Wood, rather than in the regimented patterns that were popular during the Victorian era. Her borders were often arranged in what we call cool and warm colors, and this was yet another theme that Beatrix would adopt in her own garden. 
Well, it goes without saying that Goethe Jigo made a great impression on Beatrix, who later had the opportunity to acquire her archives in 1948 and later uh, donate them to the University of California at Berkeley, where Beatrix's archives are today. Well, during this trip, she also visited the Grave Time Manor, which is the famous home of the gardening expert William Robinson. And as probably a number of you here in the audience today know, it's a famous country house, Relay Chateau, Country House Hotel. Robinson wrote a number of books, including The English Flower Garden and another one called The Wild Garden. One of his best books. It was published in uh, 1870. Oh, we lost it? Well, we'll just have to talk about it. I wonder what happened to it. Well, anyway, um, Robinson popularized the idea of working with native plants, which is another theme that Farron would um, incorporate in her own work. As a matter of fact, she was a genius in weaving naturalistic landscapes into classic, classical design framework, as she did uh, in her masterpiece, uh, Dumbart Notes, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Well, on her return to uh, New York, after her wonderful trip with her mother, Beatrix then launched her career as a, as she called herself, a landscape gardener. She didn't want to call herself a landscape architect and be associated with men. <laughs> she, began, she began accepting small commissions from friends and family. And she also began writing articles for Scribner's magazine and also uh, Sargent's publication called Garden and Forest. Also at this time, she began assembling a serious garden library and became a deep scholar of garden design. It's interesting to note, by the 1950s, she had well over 2,700 volumes in her library. Some of them were folios dating from the 16th century. This is a library that surely rivaled her aunt. And this is a wonderful photograph of her that was taken by the uh, English photographer Lolly Charles. Well, several of her early projects were, not surprisingly, in the Bar Harbor area in Maine, where her parents had a summer home called Reef Point, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Her unusual, and it was there that her unusual career soon became the talk of the town and all the society columns that had previously reported all the cotillions, weddings, and dinners that she had attended. One columnist actually reported that she was supervising over 200 men in excavating a site for a garden for a man named Edgar Scott, who was, in fact, a young millionaire from mainline Philadelphia and also happened to be the son of the founder of the Pennsylvania Railroad. This project called Children was the first of over 50 summer places that she designed, and like most of the gardens that she designed in the Bar Harbor area, it's no longer extant. Well, it turns out that publicity about her work, such as this beautiful little sketch for a lich gate in Seal Harbor, the articles that she began writing, and not for nothing, her patrician background, led to an invitation in 1899 to become a charter member of the American Society of Landscape Architects. So today she's recognized as the first woman to maintain a successful landscape practice and also to rise above the invisible line between garden design, to which women were often restricted in the early days, and landscape architecture, which was then, as I said, a field that was dominated by men. Well, unquestionably, Edith Wharton, who, as you all know, was her father's sister, was an important early influence on her career. She introduced her to her friends in Newport, for example, such as the architect Hawkins Codman, 
with whom Edith had written, of course, her book on the decoration of houses. Beatrix collab collaborated with Codman on a design for a trellis at Land's End, which was Edith's Newport house, shown in these beautiful unsigned watercolor sketches that are in the parents' archive at UC Berkeley. Well, Beatrix was also involved in a couple of Codman commissions uh, in Newport. Guess what? <laughs> so in 1900, uh, young Beatrix also advised, we use the word advised, on the grounds at the mound, but notably her contribution was limited to the magnificent entry drive and also a large uh, unbuilt Lenota style kitchen garden. I don't have a slide of it, but it's a beautiful drawing that's included in my book. Um, not unreasonably, it was never built. So the young Beatrix capitalized on the seasonal robings of her social peers as they traveled from resort to resort, Newport, Bar Harbor, or Long Island in the summer, the Berkshires and Tuxedo Park in the autumn. In Tuxedo Park, for example, she proposed a garden for one client, which you're seeing on the screen. Uh, she advised on the plantings in the local train station. In her early work, such as these unsigned sketches for a rose garden that she designed for Percy Chubb, for his garden on Long Island, she has a simple, has a simple romantic charm. And here we have on the left a sketch for an entrance arbor in a Greenwich garden. Realized many years later in a large project that she did for Henry Harris in Chestnut Hill, Pennsylvania. But one of her largest commissions in the early 1900s when she was just making a name for herself was her Newbold cousins in Jenkintown, Pennsylvania. Mary Scott Newbold was a sister, was the sister of Edgar Scott, whom we met in Bar Harbor. And here Beatrix pulled out all the stops with a grand scheme with a formal, large formal garden, numerous walls, gates, fountains, exedras, everything. She worked here from 1900 to 1916 and exhibited these beautiful renderings and follow-up photographs at, at the annual exhibits of the Architectural League of New York and also the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, which really tells us that she was hitting the architectural and design market and not the gardening market. And this also helped spread the word about her career and helped enlighten the public about the artistic merits of landscape architecture. <coughs> Well, Belfield in Hyde Park, New York, is a rare example, a rare survival of a garden designed in Beatrix Farron's early period. It was designed in 1912 for her cousin, Thomas Newbold. I'm, I'm sure a number of people here have been to visit it. It's a long axial garden enclosed by stone walls and hemlock edges. At one time, when it was originally designed, it was surrounded by dense woods. It's a simple design, and you can see from these photographs on the top one, the tree that had just been planted a decade ago, now on the lower photograph is matured. In the absence of planting plans, the restoration the narrowing perspective looking from the house down to the woodland very cleverly made the garden look appear much longer than it actually is. In the absence of planting plants, the restoration included replanting the borders with Gertrude's eagle and filed color schemes of soft hues, all done by the Beatrix Farron Garden Association, which was a volunteer group that was uh, organized 
who still maintain the garden today. Unfortunately, the original architectural components in the garden, such as the gates and trellises, all survived and they were quickly refurbished in June, of course, at the perfect time to visit this stellar garden. So in 1915, Beatrix was then asked to design a large demonstration rose garden at the New York Botanic Garden. Beatrix, in fact, was an expert on roses, which she first learned about in her grandmother's garden in Lucretia Rhinelander Jones her garden in Newport, and in this scheme for the New York Botanic Garden called for 138 beds in varying configurations. And it was all based on a very famous rose garden just outside of Paris. It had three radiating paths that converged on a central gazebo that served as a focal point. It was actually a collaborative effort between the New York Botanical Garden and the Horticultural Society of New York had supplied all the roses. But unfortunately, due to financial reasons, the garden was never fully installed until many years later. And these are her uh, original sketches where she proposed a gazebo. You can see the enclosing walls and many other details, all of which were left unbuilt. And the garden unfortunately languished for many years. However, the good news is the garden was revived in the 1980s at the suggestion of Beth Strauss, at which point Farron's gazebo and walls were built. And what a difference the gazebo makes. And thanks later to the generosity of David Rockefeller, who was then Regard the complete restoration of the garden when it was undertaken and it was then renamed the Peggy Rockefeller Rose Garden. A number, and then a number of years ago, the garden was replanted yet again to include new cultivars as well as the historic roses. And it seems to me this is a garden that Farron would undoubtedly have loved to have visit her herself. So in 1913, First Lady Ellen Wilson invited Beatrix Jones to design the East Garden at the White House, which is shown in this beautiful uh, watercolor rendering. And the commission may have come through Beatrix's recent introduction to a young man, not so young man, middle-aged man named Max Farron who was a constitutional scholar, wish he were here today. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Princeton friend of Woodrow Wilson. She had just started working on the Princeton campus. And then after her marriage to um, Max Farron in December 1913, when she was 41 years old, she was then known as Beatrix Farron. In fact, years later, she said in a, a crisp letter to one of her uh, university assignments when they cut the check in the wrong name, she said, my name is Beatrix Farron without any qualifying Mr. or Mrs. or Miss. I regard Beatrix Farron as sort of a trade name. She'd worked under the name Beatrix Jones for almost 20 years, and this disappointed Bax, who was never known as Beatrix Jones' parent. Well, after Ellen Wilson's untimely death in 1913, the garden was later installed by Wilson's second wife, Edith Wilson, in 1915, shown here in this uh, color slide from the Archive of American Garden Collection. And as we all know, the garden has gone through many different transformations, one of the most famous of which, of course, is the Bunny Mellon Garden that's now on this site. Well, like many other landscape architects at the time, Beatrix had many commissions on Long Island's North Shore. Her clients there included E.F. Whitney, George Pratt, Percy Pine, Teddy Roosevelt, for whom she designed 
tombstones in a private cemetery in Oyster Bay. But in 1919, she was hired by the legendary financier Otto Kahn to remodel and extend the gardens that had originally been laid out by the Olmsted firm, the Olmsted brothers. Mrs. Kahn allegedly disliked the Olmsted garden and wanted something more intimate. So they came up with the idea for this Dutch garden with the annual displays of tulips shown in this beautiful vintage photograph by Maddie Edward Hewitt in the 1920s. So it turns out that every year until Otto Kahn's death in 1934, Farron would refresh the garden. She'd come with her team of office staff. Unfortunately, nothing remains of it today, and some of you will recognize the site is what by, by its name today called Ohika Hotel and Resort. The Willard Strait Estate on Long Island was probably the, one of Beatrix Farron's best known gardens of the era. She designed it for Dorothy Payne Whitney, who was one of the wealthiest women in America. And Farron worked here from 1914 to 1932, which were peak years of her career. It was a large, complex project that generated over a hundred working drawings that included, that clearly demonstrated her agility in balancing formality and informality. And if you look at this watercolor render and you see the centerpiece was an elaborate walled garden, flower garden with a swimming pool enclosed by high hedges and Chinese inspired bathing pavilions and pagoda like summer houses. Unfortunately, little or nothing remains of this project today. But after the death of Willard Strait in 1919, Dorothy and her second husband, Leonard Elmhurst, asked Beatrix to design them a landscape at Darlington Hall uh, in England in the mid-1930s, where they had renovated an old hall to establish an experimental hall school, which is still there today. Beatrix's work, unfortunately, was cut short by World War II, but her paving and some of her planting can, see, can still be seen today. Another major project in her peak year was the Harkness family summer estate overlooking the Long Island Sound, now called Harkness Memorial State Park. Edward Harkins, his father, was an early investor in Standard Oil. The grounds had been previously laid out in a fashionable um, Italian age style. But in 1919, once again, Mary Harkness, the lady of the house, asked Beatrix Farron to add a new garden for her, called the Oriental, then called the Oriental Garden, to display a, a large collection of Chinese and Korean sculptures. And it was planted in beautiful soft colors with these striking heliotrope standards that are still raised and displayed in the garden today. Unfortunately, all the sculpture has been removed because it is a state park. The new garden provided a dramatic contrast with the old Ita Italian garden or Italianate garden which had been designed by the architect, which was planted and drilled with brightly colored bedding plants. But nonetheless, Beatrix redid it by adding more perennials and softening the effect by adding some climbing vines. When her work was done there, she was followed by another landscape architect, Marion Coffin, and several other uh, consultants came in to work at the garden. But thanks to the friend, their volunteer group, the Friends of Parkness, and the state of Connecticut, the gardens at Veolia have been fully restored and can be enjoyed by the public. Well, although she traveled up and down the East Coast, Beatrix Farron's heart was always at Reef Point in Bar Harbor, where her parents had bought a property in 1882. So as a young, young child, she had watched the large single-style house being built 
And then many, many years later, she and Max spent summers there creating an extensive garden. But the ground itself was rough and rocky, so she retained all the native plants, much to the amusement of her neighbors, who all had very trim lawns. And there she grew various perennials, such as these mile high the lectrums, all in a naturalistic setting, much like <coughs> Richard Diggle's Munstead Wood. The flower garden seamlessly merged into the woods. There was no, whoops, there was nothing formal about the garden. <coughs> Well, most of Beatrix's work in the Bar Harbor area was destroyed by the fire in 19, massive forest fire in 1947. And all that remains in some cases are just these photos, which may come on the screen shortly. <laughs> <laughs> and one example is a garden that she designed for Louise Saddleway, who was one of three daughters of J.P. Morgan. And what she did here was literally carve, carve the garden out of stands of spruce and pine with a clearing in the lawn with dazzling flowers and irregular shaped island. This just gives you an idea of one what plan for one year for one garden, how intensively, how intensively planted everything was. Well, in the 1920s, Beatrix designed a small garden in Bar Harbor for Mildred McCormick of Chicago to complement a tiny little cottage. She created a, a typical cottage garden with three compartments divided all by cottage by high hedges. Um, and this is a, one of those wonderful slides from the Archive of American Garden Repository showing the garden in the 1920s. So it shows that Farron could work at almost any scale with the appropriate features. She also designed gates, arches, and seats in a colonial revival sort of arts and crafts style that she used for these smaller properties. The well-known garden was beautifully restored in the 1980s and it's occasionally open to the public on a completely different scale. The, uh, arch, the Abbey Aldridge Rockefeller Garden in Seal Harbor probably needs a little introduction to most people in this audience. Undoubtedly one of Beatrix Farron's most important gardens. Sort of an excellent example of her genius in spatial planning, detailing, plant expertise, and also a brilliant display of Formality and informality. She worked with the Rockefeller family for 10 years, from 1926 to 1936. And then later on, she worked with John D. Rockefeller Jr. on laying out the carriage roads at, roads at Acadia National Park. So here's the garden that was carved out of a clearing in the woods, located a considerable distance from the large house by a path that meandered through the woods. And so against a dense backdraft of spruce and pine, Farron created a grand sunken flower garden, as you can see from this plan, surrounded by a high wall. And on the exterior, an Asian-inspired garden for display of the Rockefeller's Asian collection. And then the main access, as you can see on the left, it's called the Spirit Walk that runs parallel to the uh, flower garden. And here's your, here's your Spirit Walk lined with Korean processional figures, planted with native ground covers such as low bush blueberry, bunchberry, and a carpet of moss that seamlessly blends with the woods. Well, the large central flower garden, which is similar to the, actually to that sunken garden at Hampton Court in England, was originally planted as a cutting garden, as you can see from the 
archive of American garden slides from 1934. But it was replaced with lawn and two years later in 1936 after a visit from the Garden Club of America and I think uh, Abby Alder Rockefeller thought it was just too much to keep up and she, as I said, replaced it with lawn, which is what we have today. So by the early 1960s, the gardens had a second life when Peggy Rockefeller took over. After visiting English gardens, including Rosemary Berries in England, she introduced the concept of hot and cool sections. Today, the garden is known as the Abbey Garden and it's now under the management of the Land and Garden Preserve. And the garden dazzles with a blending of plants and set against beautiful architectural features. Just quickly show how the garden is awash with color, a delightful mix of changing annuals that are all grown by seed on site, plus perennials, and some beautiful eye-catching lilies garden is open July to September by reservation only. If you want to visit the garden, you must book online at gardenpreserve.org. Immediately after this lecture, sign up. <laughs> <laughs> and so at Dunbar Notes, which is considered her masterpiece, it was actually the natural landscape that dictated the design. We have a formal terrace which surrounded the house, such as the rose garden, which we're looking at, and then more informal areas where the, the rough ground sloped down almost 50 feet. The more naturalistic areas down the slope, such as Lover's Lane Pool, a splendid example of William Robinson's ideas. And there was many, the many magnificent old trees on the estate really dictated some of the parents' design solutions. <coughs> and also of note are some of the beautiful structures that were designed, such as gazebos. And one of the delights at Dunbar notes, of course, is the system of walkways, such as the brick boxwood walk, walk that we're looking at, that would lead from one area to the other. It's basically a green garden filled with classical elements designed by Barron, but also some of her successes, such as Bruce Haven, all of which enhanced the garden experience including a series of custom, custom design benches throughout the garden. The garden, of course, is at its best in the spring and the autumn with sweeps of uh, color from ornamental trees and shrubs, such as crab apple oil. But the blizzards were often away on the diplomatic circuit. They were never there in the summer. So green is the main color of Dunbar notes. Well, Beatrix worked at Dunbar Oaks from 1921 until the estate was transferred to Harvard in 1940, and later Farron helped Mildred Bliss assemble her famous garden library at Dunbar Oaks. Dunbar Oaks Park, which was once integral with Dunbar Oaks, was late, it was donated separately to the National Park Service by the Blizzard. In 1945, when it then opened to the public for the first time, it was considered one of the most beautiful naturalistic landscapes in America, and here we're seeing this beautiful vintage slide. And here we see Forsythia Gate, which was the gateway which separated the naturalistic garden from the formal garden. Thanks to the efforts of the nonprofit Dunbar Oaks Park Conservancy working in collaboration with the National Park Service, the entire property is being restored to its formal beauty. It consists of hundreds of acres of woodlands with charming water features and 
architectural elements such as bridges. While Farron devoted a significant part of her career to campus work, beginning with Princeton in 1912 when she was first commissioned, championed the idea of what she called vertical gardening, pinning shrubs and climbers to walls to save space and selecting plants, plantings to play second fiddle to the building. A campus is a place for trees and grass and nothing more, she wrote in one of her reports. Her collaborations with architects were often frustrating, but she stood her ground and wielded an iron hand. She, con she consulted at Princeton for several decades, visiting twice a year, and she later worked at Yale, but dealing with committees and academics was challenging in all of her university yeah. work. And here's a photo of her on the job at Yale in 1927. In her university work, she, the first thing that she would do was establish greenhouses to grow stock and exchange plants. A recent cultural landscape study by Heritage Landscape identified over four dozen areas on the campus at Yale that Farron consulted on. Well, in the late 1920s, Farron advised on the, at the University of Chicago campus designing new courtyards for the International House and the Oriental Institute using the same techniques of pinning shrubs against the wall, but she was abruptly dismissed in 1937 due to budget cuts. And she, and she wrote in her final report, trees do not grow overnight and transformations are not, with, are not made by waving a fairy wand. <laughs> So in 1927, Max Farron became the first director of the Huntington Library in San Marino, California, which represented a considerable adjustment to Beatrix's career. And for the most part, the years in California were not an overwhelming success. She had almost no commissions due to competition. Florence Shaw, Lockwood before us, and her institutional commissions were fraught with problems. She was a commissioner, she was a consultant at Caltech for over 10 years, where she designed this enclosed cloister garden. But her pleas for a master plan fell on deaf ears, but she soldiered on, wrestling with the architect's office when she stepped out, overstepped an invisible line with ideas that were related to walls, walks, and gratings. She also worked at Occidental College, where significant portions of her work actually remain today. But one of her California triumphs, of course, was the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, for which Mildred Bliss's mother was the chief benefactor. But during her years of consultancy, she had brushes with Lockwood to Forest, but nonetheless, she offered good advice and helped establish a botanical library for them. Well, after Max's retirement in 1941, the parents returned to Reef Point, retired to Reef Point permanently, but continued to spend winters in California. They began labeling plants and record keeping with the idea of establishing an educational center that they named the Reef Point Gardens Corporation, where the grounds, the herbarium, the library would attract students. And after Max Aaron's death in 1945, Beatrix continued with their plans. It's a wonderful photograph of the two of them with their individual chairs, libraries, and books, and all at Reef Point. Well, Reef Point, I think most people don't understand, was a very large, complex botanical library. Its collection of Asian shrubs was considered the most comprehensive one north of the Arnold Arboretum. In fact, one gardener who worked at Reef Point said it looked like a miniature Wisley, the Royal Horticultural Demonstration 
society demonstration garden in England. Well, even though Reef Point escaped the horrific fire in 1947, it didn't survive the economic downturn. And in the end, it really was Beatrix Heron's failure to find a professionally trained gardener to carry on her work that led her to the horrible decision to, to, as she called it, discontinue the project. It's also good to remember that in 1952, she turned 80 years old. So in 1955, she decided to give her incredible library, her extensive herbarium, and a large collection of landscape land, including geological material, to the University of California at Berkeley. She vetted 10 other institutions before she decided on Berkeley. And this is a photo uh, that was taken in 1957. It shows all of her books on display in the library there. So with all of her collection dispatched to Berkeley, she began emptying the house at Reef Point. And as well to remember that it really was no longer a house, it was an institution. And then she dismantled the house because it was really too large for her. It had become an institution and had been renovated. But the good news is that their extraordinary plant collection, such as these azaleas, or the collection of azaleas in this uh, early color photograph taken in 1949, were used to create two new gardens on Mount Desert Island that were created by Charles Savage. Astaku Azalea Garden that you can see on the left, and Thuya Garden on the right, both of which are in Northeast Harbor and are part of the Land and Garden Preserve, the Abbey Garden too. So in 1955, she moved to a place called Garland Farm in Bar Harbor, just outside of Bar Harbor, which was the farmhouse that was owned by her Reef Point caretakers, Amy and Lewis Garland. And she hired her favorite architect, Bob Patterson, also worked at Dumbarton Oaks, to design a new wing just for her that incorporated the front door, floorboards, lighting fixtures, doors, windows, and all sorts of things that she had salvaged from Reef Point. And she also uh, transplanted, um, whoops, we missed one slide, back. Uh, she also brought with her her numerous perennials, collections of heathers. No, she transplanted many of her favorite trees and shrubs that she had at Reef Point. This is a large cherry tree and laburnum. And at this time, she also designed a small terrace garden at the, at the back of the farmhouse with Georgia's eagle style cool tones on on her side, and you can see on the left, and warm tones on her caretaker's side, with a library projection in the middle so they didn't have to see each other's side. <laughs> Vintage color photographs that were taken in 1964 that helped with the recent restoration. And she brought with her, her numerous perennials, including an outstanding collection of headers, she first admired Heather's on useful trips to Scotland. And it was here in, at Garland Farm that she died in February 1959. So when the newly formed Beatrix Barron Society acquired, uh, things jumping around, oh well, back. Uh, When the newly formed Theatre Farron Society acquired the site in 2003 as an education center, the gardens were overgrown, seriously overgrown, but they were not, but had not um, been altered. So the terrace gardens were restored by a team of master gardeners in Maine, 
who moved the plants to a holding bed while they did all the necessary improvements to the site. Following the detailed uh, recommendations by Presley and Associates, missing statuary was returned to the garden. I'm sorry, you can't see it. Uh, to complete the project, and this is the cool side. And this is the hot side that you can't see. <laughs> today, the Theater Clarence Society offers programs to exhibit and a library that replicates the one that Beatrix Farron donated to the University of California at Berkeley. And then the final picture of Beatrix Farron. In her obituary, which she wrote, which she wrote herself <laughs> many years before her death, she said her life had been a happy one, but her close friends and associates recalled that she was a perfectionist in everything she did. One went as far as to call her Queen Elizabeth <laughs> for her perfect posture and commanding presence. Her greatest accomplishments, however, were sharing her exceptional knowledge of horticulture, incomparable landscapes she designed or advised on, and her professional approach to everything she did. She was definitely a product of Edith Wharton's old New York. I should just make one little comment here and just say the new edition of my book has many more projects plus photographs showing current planting, some of those restored gardens, and also an updated list of commissions and places to visit. So thank you very much, and if you have any questions, I'll